hear my music. Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada, streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Float, Odyssey, Telegram, Twitch, and sometimes the Prepper Broadcast Network. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is October 16th, 2022. This is episode 186 of the workshop podcast. And if your guys' uh, pre-show questions are indication enough, we are in for a good show. I've got Dane D. here from the Gunmetal Armory. How are you, Dane? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Very, very good. We got uh, Dane's just on audio this evening, guys, but uh, he can see all the texts, all the questions you send through. We're going to work our way That's through, cool. and yeah. So, who are you, Dane? Where'd you come from? <laughs> um, I, I'm just your average guy, man. Basically, I grew I grew up in Arizona. Um, I grew up doing the shooting and the you know outdoor stuff, and, and uh, moved out to Oregon for a little while spend some time out there and then you know my home was arizona so i came back to arizona and um you know i was kind of i've always worked retail you know my whole life i kind of worked retail and did you know jobs yeah. there, um, there um i worked security uh quite a few times you know in my younger years um nice. did some bouncing stuff like that um yeah um, and then from there, I, you know, I, I had a real passion for firearms. So I went into the gunsmithing program at a local college cool. and I just absolutely loved it, man. I just ate it up, dude. So, um, spent about, uh, three, four years there and, um, learned everything I could and then went directly into working, um, as a gunsmith for myself for myself and for uh other various companies um i think i've worked at every gun shop here in town <laughs> nice <laughs> um and a few that aren't in town um, um i also have been writing articles for numerous different places you can uh you can see my articles on american partisan um you can see them on prepper broadcasting you can there's i've written so many ghost writing articles for various tactical uh, blogs that I, I can't name because they're ghost articles. Mm -hmm. um, but my work is, is, is a lot of places, is a lot of places, man. Um, so I, uh, you know, I doing, doing the gun stuff and the security stuff for so long. Um, I kind of got burnt out after a little while because there was a lot of politics in yep. the gun community, not just in the world of guns, you know, with actual politics, but there's, you know, people that don't like each other and people that do and, you know, local spats and tiffs. So I needed to break <laughs> from it, you know. <laughs> so uh, I decided to take a break from gunsmithing for a while. And actually, I've actually been doing uh, mental health. Before the <laughs> I know, right? Complete 180. <laughs> Whatever. That's cool. Yeah, man. yeah. so um, I've been doing mental health for, oh, I don't know, about a year and a half. You know, just just to see if I could help other people. You know, I help people with PTSD. I help SMI people. Um, I'm a behavioral health paraprofessional. So I help out with that stuff. Um, but I, I know, I know myself and I know it won't be long before I'm back in the, in the gun and security world, but I figure the, the training with, you know, mental health and, and mental states will definitely be helpful in that world. Absolutely. So how yeah. did you get into, I, I'm sure it was just kind of a occupational hobby at that point, but how did you get into lock picking and evasion and all that kind of stuff? Oh man. So, um, that's, a, that, that's interested me ever since I was a little kid, you know, um, I've, uh, I don't know, like, I'm sure like a lot of your, your listeners, I probably, you know, I, I, I grew up, you know, wanting to get into things that I shouldn't be getting into. <laughs> oh yeah, we just call that climbing yeah. fences. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> so I, I always, you know, growing up, I looked at locks and I thought, you know, like there's got to be a way through that, right? Yeah. And I, you know, started started to learn about you know locksmiths and stuff like that. And I'm no certified locksmith, not by any means. But once I got old enough and was able to afford buying lock pick sets and 
stuff like that. Um, I was getting as many uh, locksmithing tools as I could get and just practicing on any lock and every lock I could get my hands on. And, you know, like I said, I, I'm not like lock picking lawyer on YouTube and YouTube. I'm not that, <laughs> you know, Oh yeah, whatever. I, I, I try my best to, you know, open any lock I can uh, anytime I can. Um, for example, at work, you know, the nurses will routinely lock themselves out of their offices <laughs> <laughs> and they'll go, Dane, come open this door. That's awesome. So, you know, I'll, uh, I'll pick the lock on their office or I'll just use a, an, uh, a UDT to open it up. You know, it just depends. And what is that? Um, but yeah, that uh, under the door tool. Yep. Yeah. You can get them from like Sparrow lock picks or red team tools, you know, one of those places, but um, yeah, man, it's just, you know, it's something that I've always been interested in. And now that, you know, I have a little bit of money here and there, I tend to buy and get yeah. as many tools as I can to practice what I can. Um, I, I, you know, I've learned a lot about, you know, getting into various areas I shouldn't, but the, the, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the places that I'm concentrating on the most right now is, is vehicles and, yeah, most vehicles you can just you know, pop out the window, like pop it out a little bit with like a air wedge and just unlock them that way. But oh. you know, I want to know more about the the locks themselves and the and the ignition and all that. So that's cool. Yeah, I remember when the the chipped keys first started coming out and they'd bring them to us to cut mm. in the hardware store, and I was always so nervous because they're like two hundred bucks. And so I, I got a okay, kind of had an ulterior motive for bringing you on because I, I told you, though, oh. so you know, but <laughs> I. Uh, so I, I, on occasion, have to go in and secure abandoned properties. People walk away from after they've, you know, they've decided they're not going to pay their mortgage. So they walk away. So then the bank or the property companies call me and say, hey, Tim, you need to go change the locks. Make sure the house is empty. Change the locks. I do it, mm -hmm. I don't know, eight or 10 times a year. And one time I stood there for about half hour, 45 minutes drilling out a lock. Finally, okay. stepped through the door. And as I did, my wife is in the kitchen already. So I, she went and checked the unlocked door on the deck and I just assumed <laughs> that all the doors were locked. So of course, of course. Yeah. Now I deal with mostly residential locks. You know, do you guys have Wiser in the state still or is Wiser, was that just a Canadian thing? You know, Wiser locks? Um, they, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. They're, they're very them. similar. They're a W, 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 R three key. Anyway, they're similar to a, a quick set some, and not, okay very similar to a quick set anyway. So, and I've bought a bunch of junk online, like the little vibrating, it almost looks like a mini screwdriver, you know, it's yeah, like a, bump. yeah, yeah. Like a, like a toothbrush, you yeah, know, like I had no luck with that. So where does one start? If you just, what you'd like to be able to do is get into a residential house. If you've locked yourself out or you need to change the locks without being destructive. Okay. So, if it was me first, I would, I would look and see, you know, is the deadbolt locked? If the deadbolt's locked, you will probably have to pick it. Hopefully like I'd say 90% of deadbolts are just basic deadbolts. Okay. Yep. Um, like drilling them can be a problem. Like if you look inside the lock and you see like a piece of metal, like the first pins steel, Yes. Chances are you're going to have a hell of a time with that, right? I have, yes. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> get them power by drill bits out and actually get in there, right? Yep. Um, so one thing that uh, you'll want to look at is, is check something like that. But generally, um, to get through deadbolts, you know, first of all, to practice, you want to practice, 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 right? So go down to your local thrift store and buy as many old deadbolts out of their little bin they have all those you know locks in yep. um get those things out of their housing and practice as much as you can um but generally most of those locks aren't going to have um any kind of real security features like like a much thinner keyway or um like uh security pins you know about security right. pins right yes yep i do i i watch okay. lock picking so where going, so on and so forth yeah. Okay. So most of them aren't going to have that stuff in them. Like I said, like 90%, 85%. But for me, the way that I do it is I just try to find what stuff is the most common in my area or yes. the, you know, the places I'm going. Like if I was you and I was securing property, 
I'd be looking at, okay, every single one of these places has a Schlage lock on it or a quick set or something like that, right? Exactly. So I'd, I'd be looking at all of that. Like, okay, how many of these places, you know, I'll go over to my friend's house. What kind of deadbolt does he have? Go over to my mom's house or my aunt's house or whatever. Keep looking in those areas that you're in to see what's most common. <clears throat> now, if you've got security pins, well, that's a whole other problem. That's, that's going to take a little bit more than just your average kind of lock picking. Um, but what I like to do the most for me, um, I like raking. You know, raking okay. is pretty much the best way really? for me. What about you? Uh, no, that's great. I mean, I really, I have had almost no luck with this yet. So I'm totally, do you have a, where, where does one get a raking tool that actually works? Because the stuff I've bought has been junk. Okay. So what you want, at least for me, um, the ones that I like to use are from South Ord, uh, South Southern Ordnance, South Ord. You ever okay. heard of them? Okay. So uh, South Ord or Sparrow's Lock Picks, either one of those. What you're looking for is a type of lock pick called a Bogota pick, B-O-G-O-T-A, like the uh, Bogota, Colombia. Okay. So you want the Bogota type picks, or Bogota, I guess, if you want to pronounce it like it's in Colombia. <laughs> but uh, those picks, for me, as far as raking goes, I mean, you've got like single hump, double hump, triple hump. You've got uh, some that have a little bit of standoff. You have multiple different types of them, but those ones for me, for my money, I go back to those things over and over and over again. If you can't come across one of those, get yourself a snake pick or a wave pick. And those are going to be amazing for you too, because when it comes to raking, you know, you're doing that, that either that in and out or that circular up and rake motion in the back up, rake back up, rake back. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those work really, really well. Now, the other thing you're going to want to take a look at as far as deadbolts go, if you can find yourself a, um, a plug spinner, that, that would be an ideal tool to have. Okay, um, A lot of people, when they're picking deadbolts, they're, they're actually holding tension in the wrong direction. So they'll end up you know, kind of sort of picking it, and then the lock, the lock just stops because they're trying to turn it the wrong direction. Right. So... You can either buy a plug spinner, or you can get those on any lock picking website, um, um, or you can kind of like put your hand up to the to the lock. And this is a very easy, you know, kind of poor man's way to do it, right? Yeah. But to lock to the lock, like you're trying to unlock it, and you look, okay, which way would I turn this to unlock it, right? Right. Typically so, away from the jam, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That, that's a hundred percent it, man. So that's that's how i do that stuff mostly uh, um when it comes to like a like a door handle because you know they always have a door handle and a deadbolt or mostly they have a door handle and a deadbolt both are going to yes. be locked so depending on if it has the dead latch on the inside some have a dead latch some don't um but i like loiting you know where you where you slip the uh like a small shim or something in there like a credit card or whatever and just pop that thing I, open i did that a lot in high school uh unofficially and i was good at it until it had that night latch and then i started running into those i was like shit that doesn't work very well yeah those those can be a bit of a pain in the ass um but yeah if you can if you can pull that off it's great um there's a lot of really good tools for that um one of the tools uh i'd have to look up what it's called um there's a bunch of places that make them but um Let's see, oscardelta.co.uk. They make a lot of escape and evasion gear, but they also make a lot of uh, entry gear. Okay. And one of my favorite uh, tools for loiting that they make, uh, let's see, it's called the uh, luggage tag. It's like a shove knife, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, those things are amazing. Um, there's another one that I, uh, I made and I posted. Did you see the picture of it that I posted on Prepper Broadcasting Network yes. chat? Yep. Yeah, that one That one is actually, I, did, I redesigned it for my own purposes, but um, I'll, have to find, I'll have to find who actually made the original and get you the information. But no, those work right. extremely well. So, <clears throat> now I've got, so. we've got right now about 10 questions. So are you okay with just kind of working our way through the questions and uh, <laughs> we can uh, see how far we make it? Sure, man. I'm down. All right. So, All right. Um, holy, sh wow. That's yeah, a lot. We got a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Pippin, okay, uh, I think it's Pippin. I've never really asked him, but anyway, I'm going to go with Pippin. Pippinized or Pippinized. Says uh, suggestions for locks that are anti-pick or pick resistant. Um, so uh, that one takes time, man. You know, okay. when you have pick resistant or anti-pick locks, basically what you're going to run into is, uh, you know, those like serrated pins or a yeah. small keyway, something like that, or you might even run into like, have you ever seen, uh, you guys don't have the U S postal service up there, but sometimes like the U S postal service locks for, um, post office boxes and stuff. If you look at the key, you'll see that it, it only has like four or five pins on it, maybe four pins, Yeah, yeah but yeah. the, the, the backside of the key, like the back half inch has no, uh, uh cuts in it at all. So the, the pins are way forward in the lock. So trying to pick it is just a pain in the butt. <laughs> so That's, so it, it just yeah. takes time and practice man okay i mean honestly at least for me at least for me no that's all right yeah because that's the way the locks up here are or at least the ones we have in our town are very much the same with pins toward the front and i can imagine it makes it kind of difficult now if you're looking to buy an anti-pick or anti you know like a like a pick resistant lock mm -hmm. um the medico i think maxis is my favorite i think they call it maxis if i remember correctly it's medico. a long time okay. that Max. thing. Yeah, maxim medico maxim okay medico is one of the better companies out there now granted they are pretty expensive um but i you know That's i'm okay. poor so yeah. no <laughs> yeah, it's all I right like, like medico. yeah so uh but that's if if that's what uh Mr. Pippin was, was asking about. I think so. Yeah. Um, that's a good start for sure. As far as, yeah. yeah. If, if there's certain, are there certain brands that tend to be um, a little more pick resistant Tough. or better quality? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and it, I mean, it depends on how much you want to spend, man. You know, like a uh, lock picking lawyer, of course he shows so <laughs> many different <laughs> types of locks on there, man. It's crazy. But um, yeah, dude, that's, that's, that's the way I look at it anyway. Um, let's see the Pippin Pippinized. Is that his name? Yeah, sure. We'll go with Pippinized. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, door frames and yes. the possible weaknesses and where the deadbolt locks into, uh, usually a two by four door frame. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if he's asking how to like toughen these up or if he's asking where the weaknesses are. Um, if you're asking to like how to toughen these up, uh, three inch screws, three inch screws, three inch screws. Yep. You know, if you've got a two by four door frame that is connecting to more two by fours that are inside the wall that are going to be like up against a door switch or something like that. Um, if you pop most of the, the screws that go into like a, uh, hinges or the strike plate or something like that, or even the hinges, Oh wait, I said that already hinges. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so most of the screws are not very deep. So if you pop in um, really, really deep, like three inch screws, two and a half inch, even three and a half inch screws, that will massively upgrade the security on that door. Um, I think that uh, if, if you're talking about the weaknesses in a normal door frame, Mm -hmm. um, it depends on how tightly it's fitted. Like we were talking about loiting earlier. That's a big weakness. Um, but one of the biggest ones that I see is the under the door. Okay. Like the under the door tool. Okay. Those are really, really nice to use depending on the type of, um, of latch you're dealing with or type of knob or whatever, whatever is on the other side of that door. You can sometimes use those to open doors, especially in you know um business. business areas you know especially in office buildings and stuff like that but yeah that's the way that that's the way that i look at it the other area that i would consider to be weak is with boards with hinges uh they're exposed now you can get security hinges of course but you can get a, a hinge removal tool and pop those things out so fast if the hinges are on the outside it's it's not even funny that those little so, spring spring loaded ones that you just pull back and pop up you got it, man. Yep. Exactly like that. They, they look like a glass breaker or something like that. Yeah. Those things work like a charm. I've had my eye on them for a while. They just in 
straight up legal work, they come in handy quite a bit too. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And if you have a lot of carpentry, you can get the one that sets nails for you too. Just yeah. <laughs> a little nail set. How about <clears throat> um, different states and laws while carrying lock picking tools? Now, I know this isn't legal advice, but do you know if in any area people need to be concerned about being caught with that on their person? Okay, so from what I've read, at least in Arizona, and I would assume that this is true for a lot of places. Like, you know, of course, we all know what happens when you assume, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, um, I told my kids that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but from, from what I've seen, you know, a lot of the, the, the law enforcement guys that I've known, um, as far as the laws go, there's, there's a law here in Arizona called uh, – it, it has to do with burglary tools. Okay. And let's say that you're a carpenter or you're a, um, you do demolition for a living, you know, you demo houses. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have a sledgehammer and a crowbar in your truck, you know, for doing demolition. Now those are just tools until you use them for a burglary. Then they become burglary tools. Okay. Same thing. The way Arizona looks at it, the same thing with lock picks. You're a locksmith or you just do lock sport for fun. Until you use them for some sort of illegal activity, they're nothing more than a piece of metal. They're then nothing they more become, than... Yeah, something yeah, yeah. that they can pad the charges with at that point. Exactly. They become a quote-unquote burglary tool. Okay. Right. So that that's that's the lead, that's the gist of the legality that I know on it. As long as as long as you're not using it for something nefarious, <clears throat> it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> and there are multiple ways that you can conceal them. Okay. Also, like you can get the titanium ones from Searpick, and you could I I braided a whole bunch of those into lanyards that are on my keychain. You know, it's Great not idea. hard to do. Yeah, I mean, I I was actually thinking about selling those at one point. I, I've made so many lock picks for people. It's you know, but anyways, it's, yeah, you just braid them into there, or I like to take those small picks and I'll sew them into my baseball caps inside the sweatband or Ooh, okay. you know, make a small pouch for my watch band and pop them in there or cut the tongue of my shoe and slide them into there. I mean, there's the titanium is non-magnetic, so it's not going to show up on a metal detector. It will potentially show up on a density detector or backscatter x-ray if you're going through an airport or something like that but you know i'm I'm not sure what the legality of taking lock picks on an airplane is they're not really like a weapon so i don't think they'd have a problem with them but you'd have to check your local area on that okay so it comes down to intention suspect and what they catch you doing at that time in most instances i'm guessing yeah at least that's what i've seen anyway sure how about, Definitely not legal advice. <laughs> yeah, no, yes, no. Everybody right, right? knows here that, uh, yeah, the, the drunken ramblings of uh, the workshop are never, never uh, legal advice. We know this. So. <laughs> so how about lock picking in a shit hits the fan scenario? What do you think? Because, well, of course, I don't know if you read much prepper porn. I read tons of it. And it's there's always a lock pick. There's always a guy who's like, hey, just wait. And he pulls his shit out of his belt. And he's like, you know, and in he goes, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so in an SHTF scenario, I, okay, there, there's very few scenarios that you're going to run into, at least in my opinion, where you, if it's SHTF, why wouldn't you just stick your foot right through the door? You know what I'm saying? Like, why wouldn't you just, yeah, like I, I have a, I have a Halligan tool and multiple, uh, double tap sledgehammers. They're, 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 they're they're extendable. They have titanium handles. They're used by SWAT teams for entry. Um, I, I, I have a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't have, but I do. Um, okay. um, so I would I would just take a crowbar or a Halligan tool and stick it right into the door frame, right? You know, maybe above or below, probably above the uh, deadbolt. Smack that thing into the lock a few times, dude, or right above the lock there, and just pry it. Wham! Pry it right open, dude. It, it would take maybe a few seconds. If you ever if you ever want to see it, watch a firefighter do it. They're, they're yeah. coming through that door, dude. You know? Is that so? Is that the one that has? It looks like a a beefy crowbar with two what like two kind of teeth on it or is it just one that you yeah, yeah okay those are cool uh, yeah. and they can yeah. get them behind the lock and twist them sometimes too if they need to 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a couple of different designs, but um, Zach Tools, Z-A-K, they're, they're a really good company for that. Um, Double Tap Tools, they make some really good ones. Um, even 511 makes some, some pretty nice ones. So any of those companies, you know, and, and I recommend that every prepper has a, uh, a Halligan tool and a sledgehammer. Uh, failing that, get yourself one of them old school Stanley Foo Bars. Oh, I don't I know if you've ever seen those before. Yes. Those things are amazing, dude. The big ones, the big, yeah. long 36 inch ones. <laughs> ones you can use for uh, rearranging floor joists or, or, or making floor joists uh, behave, you know? Yes, sir. Those yeah. things are amazing for, for going through doors, windows, even a wall, dude. So that's the thing. In an SHTF scenario, if I went into, into a door, man, I, I might even just decide to opt to go right through the wall next to it. You know, I mean, it, well, it depends. Yeah. Now, I will say there are scenarios where you don't want anyone to know that you've been there. Okay. Right. So if that's the case, then I'm carrying my, uh, my SEER pick, the company SEER pick, S E R E P I C K, SEER pick. I'm carrying my, uh, my Bogota picks from them. They're, they're itty bitty. They're maybe two inches long and they've got a Bogota pick on one side and a tension tool on the other, all in one piece. There's two of them, titanium. Okay. Um, one is a single hump. The other one's a triple hump. So I'm carrying those with me, uh, hidden somewhere on me. Um, I'm carrying multiple handcuff keys and stuff like that, but those are going to be my, my basic tools to get into almost anything, um, that is reasonable to get into. Okay. Okay. That, and I carry a small, uh, loiting tool and, uh, I might, you know, the loiting tool can do what a shove knife can do, but I might carry a shove knife on me too. If I need a little bit more, um, uh, uh reach, if you will. Um, that might be the thing, but yeah, generally in an SHGF scenario. Oh, and one more thing I would carry with me would be a, um, uh, padlock shims. Have you ever seen those before? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you can make them out of, um, out of a Coke can too sometimes, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You carry those things with you a couple different sizes, man. You're, you're going to get through most things. Just for the record, guys, I will go back and get his list and I will post it afterwards because that is awesome. I was going to ask you at the end if you can only, cool. you know, if you can only carry a kit or a couple of tools all the time, what would it be? And I think you just outlined it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a couple more things that I have in there. In fact, you know, if you want, I'll just take a picture. Um, okay. I carry an ITS spy uh, kit, S P I E, you know, ITS imminent. Yep. I carry one of their uh, spy S P I E kits. And it has all kinds of stuff in it. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a picture of that and send it to you. And you can send it to all your people, dude. It's got awesome. like a small yes. ceramic razor in it, you know, uh, sear compass, uh, handcuff shims, key, all kinds of shit, dude. And it's maybe three inches, two and a half inches long by maybe one and a half wide. It's really itty bitty. So nice. And was that a self-contained kit you bought or is it pieces you put together? It's pieces I put together. I bought okay. the actual case, the uh, ballistic nylon case from yep. ITS, and then I put all my own stuff in it. Okay. Awesome. That's yeah. cool. That'll be huge. Yeah. Send that along. I'd love to. And I'll make sure, obviously, we'll send it out and let people know. That'd be great. Yeah. How yeah. about, uh, what do we got here? Um, helping a neighbor get into their house. Where? How do you, if you got a neighbor that comes by, knocks on your door and says, hey, Dane, uh, yeah, I did it again. Or <laughs> where, where do you start with that attack? What do you, what do you look for? Well, for, for me, I, I use the same kind of method a burglar would use, right? Look for the path of least resistance. Same with you? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, dude. Yeah, oh, yeah. My, my wife's done the same thing to me before too, man. Like you think, oh, I got this. And then she does something. You're like, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, I, I always look for the path of least resistance. Uh, check all the doors, check all the windows, um, check and see if there's any easy ways in ask them, Hey, you know, do you, did your you know neighbor have a key like over down below you or on the side of you? Obviously I don't have one. Um, does your family live close by? They have a key, but if it's an emergency, you know, like they left the, the stove on something like that, or their animals inside side like that. Um, sorry, I had to get a drink. Um, okay. I would be, I'd be heading for my uh, Bogota tools or my uh, snake picks or my wave picks. And, um, generally when people walk out of their house, 
it's always going to be their, their door lock on the bottom, you know, the handle. Yes. The door, right. It's not going to be a really complicated. It's not like they're going to lock their deadbolt and their knob when they walk out of the house. Right. So a shove knife, even a, like a luggage tag, um, a credit card, you can see if you can Lloyd it. If not, most of those doorknobs don't have like security pins in them. So okay. you should be able to rake that thing open or even zip it open. That should be either one of those should work. And um, what does zip it open mean without? Sort of oh, okay. Like, you know, you know what raking is, right? Yep, I do. Where are you? Okay. Back and forth. So, and, yeah. 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 Okay. So zipping is basically the same thing, except you, um, you just pull it out. Okay. Like a, like a zipper, you know, you just pull it out while you're holding tension and then you push it back in, uh, bring it up and then right zip it right out, dude. Instead of like, instead of going in, out, in, out, in, out, you know, like a piston, you're just pulling out. That's where your, your tension's coming from. Kind of like, kind of like the reverse of a bump key. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are, 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 um, so while you're talking about bump keys, are they still a viable option? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, there's a lot of locks out there that are still, you know, people don't like to change their locks. People don't like to call a locksmith. People don't like to do that stuff. So I think that bump keys are still a very viable option. Um, and it's not overly difficult to carry a couple of them with you there. My bump keys are in my extended kit that stays in my truck most of the time. Okay. Um, if I need it along with like a, a bump hammer, but you know, I, I don't find myself using them very often, to be honest with you. If I'm opening locks, especially at work, like I've had to open locks on trash cans. I've had to open locks on offices. I've had to open um, locks to uh, med rooms. I've had to open all kinds of different locks around the office. Uh, some of them that you would think would be extremely high security are not. Okay. Um, so I've opened all of those with uh, Bogota picks. Okay. I never needed the bump key. So just, just for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Where is, uh, I got a bunch, this is a question for me at this point. What is the best resource online for learning these kind of rudimentary lock picking skills? Um, one of the best resources uh, I have found, obviously lock picking lawyer is one of the better ones out there. Um, I like him. Uh, let's see. I like to read a lot too. So, okay. um, like, uh, oh gosh, like lockpicks.com. They're a really good one. I like their stuff. Um, and then, uh, lock noob. That's who I couldn't think of how to freaking say his name. Yeah. Lock noob. Okay. He is really, really good on YouTube. Um, but honestly, man, the best way to learn, and I'm, I hope this doesn't upset anyone, but the best way to learn it's to do it, man. It really, yeah. really is. You can look at it academically all you want. Um, it's like gunsmithing. You got to screw some shit up before you get it right, man. Like you, you got to do it, dude. You know, we've got a bunch over on uh, telegram as well. And <laughs> Chris Dixon says Ooh. that Tannerite will open a lot of doors uh, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It might be a little loud, but you'll get in. I mean, SHTF, right. I'm going right through. You know? And also says yeah. that nothing beats actual experience. And I also said that uh, like breaking into a car, oftentimes breaking the smallest window ends up being the most expensive way. So always, man, always. Isn't it always the truth? <laughs> uh, okay. I see here people are talking about three inch yeah. screws. Yep. That works absolutely wonderfully, man. How about picking? Okay. Rachel Brown wants to know about uh, debt um, padlocks. What's the best attack for those, you know, destructive, non-destructive, that kind of thing? Uh, for me, I prefer the padlock shims. Those are, those are some of the best ones. Um, but for, for, you know, it depends on the type of padlock. If you've got a warded padlock, I like to just use the warded picks, man. It's like, it's extremely easy just to stick the warded pick in there and just turn that and it opens right up, man. Um, one of these days, we're going to have to do one where, like, I can bring out all the stuff that I have and all the lock, uh, lock uh, uh, padlocks and various deadbolts and just show you, look, here's here's how I open this one. Here's how I open this. You know, because you know, I don't have anywhere near what guys like, you know, lockpicking lawyer. In the, comments, in the comments, just mentioned Bosnian Bill. That guy's amazing. That's another really, really good YouTube. Yeah, he retired, uh, eh? Yeah, from what yeah. I hear. 
Yeah, which I <clears throat> you know, his age he wanted to, but yeah, I loved him. He he'd do a lot more in depth. And the one thing I find about lock picking lawyer is he goes so fast, and he's such a he does. he's not a teacher per se. He just kind of wants to show the vulnerabilities. I guess is kind of my yeah. thoughts, you know. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, exactly. He, he's, he's like, you know, this is vulnerable. Look what I can do. Bam. You know, I'm like, okay, well, how did he do that? You know, and then, then I want to find out how he did it, right? So, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, Basel, Bill, Locke, Noob, guys like that, they're, they're showing the, the inner workings, how this works, and so on, man. So, What about automotive lock picking? Oh, geez, man. Like, uh, <laughs> I know like I we're only touching, yeah, we're just <laughs> touching on all these things. I uh, just trying to get a few uh, good questions out of you here. So, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah. yeah. So um, as far as automotive stuff goes, I tend to stick, like my mom called me about a month ago because she had locked her keys inside her car. And <laughs> all I did was take my, uh, my South Ord air wedge over there pop it into the window, just kind of slide it into the window, man, pump it up a little bit just to get enough room in the window. So I can pop one of my, um, one of my full length rods in there that I have and just click the little unlocker, dude. That's, that's the easiest way for me to get into vehicles. Okay. That's how I do. And there's Air usually wedge and a long rod. That's it. I used uh, wood wedges before too. They're not ideal because they can damage if you're not careful, but I got to try one of those air. Uh, what do you call them? The air. Um, I have one. Air wedge. Air wedge, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. great. Air wedge, yep, yep. And you can actually buy those air wedges at um, at like Home Depot and stuff too. They have them for getting underneath a door if you need to make adjustments to a door or shim a door. You know, when you're setting one inside of its frame, they have those as well. And that's something else to mention as well. If you were looking at for doors vulnerabilities, an air wedge under the door to give you some room for an under the door tool or a uh, uh, you know maybe a, a hinge attack or something to offset the lock to allow you to actually get in there and Lloyd that thing. There's a lot of freaking options, but definitely have that air wedge available to you. Cool. How about renegade butcher says, talk about when it's the right time to pick a lock and when it makes more sense to bypass the lock in other ways. Okay. Um, let's see. So I always try to do the, the fastest, most expedient thing possible. First, okay. first, um, if I can Lloyd it, yeah, I'm going to Lloyd it. I'm going to go right through, you know, um, did you see that video that I put on prepper broadcasting on the, on the, on the chat that we have among us that I just popped it right through, pulled that yes. tool that I made through. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if I can do that, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to Lloyd that thing and get right through it. Um, if, if, uh, if that doesn't work, I'm going to switch over to my picks and I'm going to switch to those Bogota clip, uh, picks every single time. Uh, if those don't work. I'm going to start looking at other options. Something that might go a little bit deeper. Um, I had one scenario where um, I don't know if you've ever seen this on a um, like a deadbolt key or even like a doorknob key, but what you'll see is let's say it has six pins, okay, that are cut into the key, and you know that the cuts are different heights. If it's a bump key, the cuts are all the way down the lowest possible setting, yes. uh, like a nine or whatever on the on the key. Um, so this lock that I was going up against, um, I was using the triple hump, uh, <laughs> pick. and oh, you okay. Oh yeah. We're good. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> Go ahead. <"Whoa." laughs> um, so I was going up against this lock and I was using this triple hump Bogota, um, pick. And it just wouldn't go. It wouldn't go. I could feel a few of the pins set. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, the, the, it's going past the shear line. It's setting. I'm about to turn this thing. And then it would stop. Hmm. And I'm like, what the hell? Why won't it go? So I just kept trying, kept trying. It wouldn't do. And then I finally switched over to a single hump uh, um, Bogota. And I started kind of going slower and the pin, setting the pin, set the pin, set the pin. And then the final pin was a really deep one. It was like a like a nine or an eight, extremely, extremely deep, the first pin, the huh. one closest to you. Okay. So like if you've ever seen this on a key, all the um all the pins in the front will be really, really shallow, like just barely cut into the key. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. And then the one closest to like the flag or the part you would touch with your fingers for, for the average person, that key, that cut is so freaking deep. It is it is the deepest it can go or right above that, right? So when you're trying to get a, a, a rake in there or something, by the 
by the time that you set the pins that are in the back, your the the the, the shaft of your tool is screwing up or or, or basically not setting the uh, the front pin there. So right. it makes it extremely difficult. You almost have to use like one of those uh, uh, um, finger picks. You know what I'm talking about? Where you like one pin, one pin at a time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So in I call it a finger pick, but I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So in, sometimes it's just a matter of if, if you're not having any success trying one thing, then change your method and try something different. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, man. I mean. But everybody's going to kind of up, pull up what they like and what they feel comfortable doing. Um, I carry around when I'm at work just for practice when I'm on lunch um, or when I'm sitting there talking to a client, you know, they're telling me about what's going on. I'll be, I'll be sitting there just, just raking locks or trying to do single pin picking while I'm talking to them. You know, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, just, you know, fidget tool, just a fidget toy. You know, like, yeah. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> most people don't know what I'm doing, so it doesn't really matter. You know, I have even just trying oh, I'm just trying to fix this lock for my mom, you know, or something like that. But the more practice you get, the better. What about, I've been seeing this on TikTok a lot lately, card readers <laughs> or electronic cards, like for either, you know, um, apartment access or hotel access. There seems to be a lot of those machines that will clone the older style ones. Have you had any experience with them at all or no? No, I have not had any experience with those, but I can direct you to the right place to get that experience. Okay. Um, I don't have the money to take their course. Um, Red Team Alliance. Hmm. RTA, okay. Red Team Alliance. They're based out of Phoenix. Their class is like, I think it's $4,000 for five okay. days. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a hit. It's a hit right to the wallet, man. But they will teach you the basic lock picking stuff that we're already talking about. They'll teach you exploits for card readers. They'll teach you double door exploits under the door tool. They'll teach you how to get the um, the electronic locks to disengage with CO2, um, wow. all kinds of stuff, man. Yeah, they, they're like infrared locks, how to disengage those, um, all kinds of stuff, dude. These guys are freaking amazing. Red Team Alliance. I added um, that to the chat the, so people can see for sure. Yeah, the uh, one of the owners of it is named Deviant Olam, O-L-L-A-M. Okay. Um, I think his website, if I remember correctly, he, he changed it at one point, but um, I believe his website now is deviating.net. And I've he has that. some okay. of the coolest crap. Yeah, dude. He has some of the coolest stuff on there that you've ever seen. So, yeah, check that dude out. Check out Red Team Alliance. Hopefully, if I can ever afford it, I'll see you in the class. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Oh, that, yeah. What about uh, uh, Pippin wants to know, should you change lock tumblers every few years? Or... Um, let well, me ask you this too. Have you had any experience with the, the smart locks where you can rekey them yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a little bit of experience with those. My brother recently moved and uh, we played around with some of the smart locks, some of the quick set smart locks. Um, they're pretty good. They're pretty decent. <clears throat> it depends on how much experience you have with them. Um, if you can, if you have the right equipment, heck yeah, man. In fact, you know, Every couple of years, even every year or every two years, you know, I would definitely try to change out your cylinder um, and pop in a couple of security pins or at least change the uh, the settings on them, uh, the okay. pin height, you know, at least change that stuff um, or pop in a couple of uh, security pins that definitely, definitely helps. The serrated ones are my favorite, but you can do whichever ones you find to work best for you. Oh, um. We have been, you're not going to believe this, we've been uh, almost 44 minutes already. And I know I promised you 45, but if you got time for... Wow. Yeah. yeah. You got time yeah, for I, got, I got time for a couple more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hunter wants to know about lock maintenance. Anything important along with um, that you need to worry about with lock maintenance? Yeah, actually, that that's a really good question. Um, so when it comes to lock maintenance... One thing you want to make sure of is that you uh, that you're lubricating that lock, okay? And please, for the love of God, do not spray WD-40 in there or any <laughs> other kind of oil, okay? Please don't do that, okay? Because eventually it's going to gum up and it's going to make it very, very difficult, okay? So what you want to use is that powdered graphite, okay? okay. Powdered graphite is a great lubricant. It's dry. Uh, dry lubricants are ideal for this. What happens if it gets gummed up or if it's not lubricated properly is some of the pins will actually stick above the shear line. 
basically, you know, the, the, the block itself ends up only having two pins instead of six or five okay. that you actually have to defeat. Okay. So make sure that your locks are properly lubricated. That's a, that's a big one, man. Um, maybe I, I would look at that stuff once a year, maybe give or take, uh, depending on the environment you're in. Um, that's what I would do. Okay. That, that's great. I, oh. we've been 40, let's, yeah. Do, uh, do me a favor, Dane, and tell everyone how they can find you, what you do on a regular basis and how people can support you by listening to whatever you put out. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Okay, so I, uh, I have my own podcast on Prepper Broadcasting Network, just like Tim here. Um, mine is called The Gunmetal Armory. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of World War II, behind enemy lines stuff, you know, how to operate and stuff like that. Um, and I've also done some modern stuff like on ambushes and things like that, how to do that stuff. Uh, so my podcast is Gunmetal Armory. Um, you can email me at gunmetalarmory at gmail.com. I also have my own website. <clears throat> called gunmetal llc um you can find me there i have two classes that i teach uh when i fill them up one class is called shtf gunsmithing and it is where we take you through uh the ins and outs of understanding you know what things you're going to need to maintain and take care of on your guns you know if there's a you know like an shtf type situation uh we're going to basically teach you the underground gunsmithing tips okay we're going to take you in there show you this stuff um head spacing uh gunsmithing basics trigger jobs troubleshooting uh we'll go through the ar-15 the ak the glock 1911s um all kinds of different stuff we, we go through a lot man in a couple of days the other class i teach um is called civilian tradecraft and it's approaching the tradecraft stuff from a civilian standpoint uh, basically we go through various techniques um, on uh, escape and evasion uh, escaping restraints um, sdrs uh, any kind of surveillance techniques safe house builds um, basic barrier and lock breaching caches dead drops so on and so forth we go through all that kind of stuff how long is that course uh that one is two days as well saturday and sunday okay. and what do they cost uh let's see i think i had one that was yeah they're both 300 dollars. nice and i thought i thought i had changed them but they're from but they're 300 each and how many um how many people do you need signed up to uh to do it um, I've done it with as little as five students, but we generally tend to prefer to have at least eight. Okay. So, but I would do it for five, especially if it was like a, a couple of guys that were just friends or, you know, a couple of guys that were family or something. They're like, Hey, you know, um, we'd like to know what you know and you know, so on and so forth. So <laughs> I'm just thinking it <laughs> might be something to organize through, uh, through the workshop community here at some point yeah. to, uh, to get a bunch of people together and do it. I would like, I think I would like that. Either one would be great, but I, I that'd be really cool. Absolutely, man. I, I would be, I'd be honored, dude. I think that'd be really fun. The other thing that I'm working on right now, and uh, I'll tell your workshop community here, you know, it's something I'm working on, but I'm, I haven't put together fully yet. I'm looking at putting together an online SHTF gunsmithing course uh, for something that you can literally get onto Skype or, you know, um, any of these other streaming platforms. And I show you all this stuff online that I can, you know, you go, Hey, you know, I've got my AR 15. How do I do a trigger job on it? Okay, here, here's what you do. I'm going to show you right now in my shop and you're going to do it while I'm doing it with you on camera. Cool. So, so I'm trying to, so I'm trying to put together, man, hopefully it'll work out. I think, I think you guys will really enjoy it if, if I get it all put together just right. So is uh, maybe, uh, is the, the current SHTF one, is that something that you teach live, but over the internet, or does it have to be in person at this point? Has to be in person. There's, oh, there's okay. so much right. we go over and yep, uh, I get it. various guns that we go through. Yeah. We have our certain person, but that's, that's the hard part about the, uh, the web stuff is like, Oh man, if I could do it online, dude, it, it's, if each person has the guns or access to the guns that I'd be working on, or even the parts that we would be talking about and maintaining that would be extremely helpful. And we could tailor that class to help that person. No problem. Or that team of people. 
That's cool. Yeah, that you got it. Yeah, cool. you got to have something online. That'd be awesome. That'd be an easy, easy sell and an easy support. I, I got some friends that run courses and stuff that I could probably hook you up with at some point. So when you get when yeah. you get ready to, to push it, let me know and we we will we will support you through here. I promise. Oh, I love that, man. Thank you so much, dude. No problem. Anything else? Um, that we've got your, your podcast and your courses there. And if somebody wants to contact you directly, what's the easiest way for someone to contact you? So the easiest way to contact me is going to be gunmetalarmory at gmail.com. All one word, gunmetalarmory. Um, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me, just gunmetalarmory at gmail.com. And nurse, nurse. Also, if you have gunsmithing questions, I mean, obviously, legal disclaimer, you do what you do with your own guns. Like, <laughs> I'm not your doctor. I don't play one on TV, right? But if you have gunsmithing questions, dude, I'll help you out, man. I'll do my best. I just, I don't, I don't want people to make a mistake and hurt themselves. So if you have questions about firearms or something like that, or even questions on, you know, lock picking, stuff like that, feel free to message me, dude. Message me, dude. I'll do the best I can. If you, if you want the the big explanation, like the whole thing where you can pretty much ask me a bunch of questions, you got to wait till I come back on Tim's podcast again. That'd be great. I'd love it. We'll have you back maybe in the new year if you're up for it. Love it, man. I'd love to. Perfect. Well, I um, if you want to hang for a second in the background, Dane, I'm just going to close up and I'll be right back with you if you're good. You got it, buddy. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone. So guys, I hope... That, that was awesome. I knew it was going to be a whirlwind tour of locks, uh, of lock picking. I know we just touched the tops of the mountains and some of this stuff. We will have Dane back to do a deeper dive, probably more than once I can just imagine, because uh, he is a fountain of information. Loved having him on. Great guy to talk to. It was nice to finally have a quote-unquote in-person conversation with the dude, but make sure you support him. If you're not, I mean, I tell you guys all the time, support Prepper Broadcast Network. But if you're not listening to his stuff, he just just a stand up dude. So do what you can, you know, give him some workshop love and we will have him back again. So, guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy and have a great week. <laughs>